Good evening. Let's all stand. Good to see you tonight. Turn to page 468 in your blue book. 468. There's a land that is fairer than day and by faith we can see it afar for the father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by we shall meet on in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore we shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious song of the blessed and our spirit shall sorrow no not a sigh for the blessing of rest in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful Father above, we will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His love and the blessing that hallow our days in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. You may be seated. Make sure I'm on there. Good evening. Good to see you. Appreciate you being in the house of God. Excited about uh, the lesson tonight. Uh, got a lot of, lot of parts and pieces we're going to try to tie together. I'm going to try to be very careful uh, of the time as well because I know the choir's got to practice here in just a few moments. So I'm going to talk fast if you all will listen fast because uh, we've, <laughs> we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, on some of this stuff tonight. Let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer and then we'll get right into it. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the privilege to be here tonight. Thank you for the wonderful time of fellowship, all those that prepared and put together the meal. Father, how I pray your richest blessings upon them. Now, Father, I pray that you just have your way tonight as I try to share what you've burdened my heart with. Uh, may it help us kind of connect the dots, not only on current events, but at the same time, Father, be looking at things from a prophetic standpoint as well. And we'll give you the praise and glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Let me get my clicker here. All right. First thing I want to start with. If you'll remember back when the whole thing with Israel and Hamas started, um, I told you that it would be about three months and you would see the whole world basically uh, turn its back on Israel and, and start pressuring them to stop any kind of offensive or any kind of uh, military action that was going on. Yesterday, December the 12th, two months since October the 7th, just a little over two months, yesterday the UN uh, General Assembly had a resolution. Uh, and in that resolution, only 10 nations backed Israel. Uh, everybody else said they needed to stop. This is an AP uh, version of the article. It says, UN General Assembly votes overwhelmingly to demand a humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. Aaron, if you don't care, scroll it on down just a little bit there. 
The UN General Assembly voted overwhelmingly on Tuesday to demand a humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza in a strong demonstration of global support for ending the Israel-Hamas war. The vote also showed the growing isolation of the United States and Israel. The vote in the 193-member world body was 153 in favor of ending the war, 10 against, and 23 abstentions. And ambassadors and other diplomats burst into applause as the final numbers were displayed. The United States and Israel were joined in opposing the resolution by eight countries. Here are the eight countries besides the U.S. and Israel who said uh, no to this resolution. And listen to the size of the power brokers we're talking about here. Austria, Chechnya, Guatemala, Liberia, Micronesia, Nauru, Papua New Guinea, and Paraguay. And the United States and Israel. Does that tell you what the world thinks ought to happen when you look at this? Uh, uh, keep on scrolling uh, down through there, buddy. Uh, stop right there. <coughs> Let's see. The United States has grown increasingly isolated in its support for Israel's military campaign in Gaza after Hamas militants killed. And again, the wording of this, and this is one of the, one of the reasons I wanted to pull up the AP article, the wording of this is incredibly interesting. Uh, for Israel's military campaign in Gaza after Hamas militants killed about 1,200 people and abducted about 240 in a surprise attack on October 7th. If you scroll on down through there, uh, uh, it's... Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, after the United States vetoed a resolution of the Security Council on Friday demanding the humanitarian cease fire, Arab and Islamic nations called for Tuesday's emergency session uh, it says, unlike Security Council resolutions, General Assembly resolutions are not legally binding, but the Assembly's messages are important barometers of world opinion. Uh, and then it says, the resolution makes no mention, now get this, who started this? Hamas. The resolution makes no mention of Hamas, and the Assembly defeated two proposed amendments mentioning the militant group. One proposed by the United States would have added a paragraph stating that the Assembly unequivocally rejects and condemns the heinous terrorist attacks by Hamas. So they will push through a resolution condemning Israel and telling them to stop, but they will not put in there why the whole thing started. All right? And then the second one was the other proposed by Austria would have added a call for the immediate release of hostages still held by Hamas. So in the same breath that they're condemning Israel, they won't even tell Hamas they need to let the, the hostages go that started this whole thing. Does that tell you where we're at? And so, and this was yesterday. Now, earlier today, uh, Aaron, when we were trying to find this, it pulled up another article. There was a UN uh, Security Council vote. The only member who voted against condemning Israel was the United States. The United Kingdom abstained. Everybody else said Israel needed to stop. And that's the UN Security Council. The only reason that didn't go through was because of the United States. But if you read through that article that I showed there, if you go on down through there, right now the U.S. is heavily pressuring Israel to stop. Now if you'll remember, like I said, when this happened on October 7th, that next Sunday, I, st I made mention of the fact, give it three months, and the world will turn against Israel. It doesn't matter what's happening. So we're already seeing that begin to happen. Now, because I've been paying attention to a lot of this stuff and just trying to keep up with what's going on in Israel and, and you know, public opinion, whatever else, just trying to look at this, it brought up a question that I've had for a long time about something that happens during the tribulation. But to connect all of the dots we need to go back a little bit further, okay? Now, if you'll remember, uh, when we did the Understanding the Times Prophecy Series here at the church, we spent a couple of weeks anyway talking about the Battle of Gog and Magog. And if you'll remember, we talked about in that, that you know, there's a lot of opinion about exactly when the Battle of Gog and Magog happens. 
And I showed you the evidence from my perspective on why I think that the battle of Gog and Magog will happen. It's either going to be, it's either going to happen simultaneously with, or it's going to be the trigger for what I think, what I think will be the trigger for the rapture. It's going to be right at the very, it's going to be the thing that kicks everything off, the rapture takes place, and then you begin to see this roll into the uh, battle of Gog and Magog, and then or you see the battle of Gog and Magog, and then you get right into the tribulation period. We talked about all of that, uh, so I'm not going to rehash that now. If you want to see that, the videos are out there. Uh, like I said, you can look at the one, I think that's the one that it's on, uh, you can look at the one that's got the most views, and there's like 15,000 views of that one episode that we've uploaded. It's the most watched episode we've ever put out there uh, from the church. And it's because when people, when stuff like this happens that we're seeing right now, people go out there and start typing in end days, Gog and Magog and whatever else. That one's got enough hits now that when it, it pops up pretty quick and a lot of people have watched it, okay? Uh, so I'm not going to rehash all of that tonight, but I do want to kind of refresh our memory about some of the key points. First of all, you have to understand the timeline. Uh, you've got the church, the battle of Gog and Magog, and the rapture. Like I said, those two events are going to happen right on top of each other. Then you've got seven years of tribulation. You have the midpoint of the tribulation. We're going to come back to that tonight toward the end. Uh, then uh, you also have the signing of the covenant at the very beginning. We talked about there that that covenant is probably the uh, world's permission, I guess is the better way of, best way of saying it, to allow Israel to build the to finish the temple or build the temple there, uh, and there will be worship in the temple for three and a half years. At the midpoint, the Antichrist says, "I'm God." A third of Israel departs uh, and rejects him as the Antichrist. Chapter number twelve, of Revelation says that they take the wings of eagles and fly into the wilderness, and that's going to come back. We'll talk about that here in a minute, and then they will be protected in that wilderness area for three and a half years, the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Then you've got the return of Christ. That's the Battle of Armageddon. Again, we'll talk about that again in just a few moments, and then you have the millennial reign of Christ. So that's kind of the overall picture of that seven-ish years. Now, here's a map of the nations uh, that are a part of Gog and Mag the battle of Gog and Magog as it's given to us in Ezekiel chapter 38 and Ezekiel chapter 39. These are the chapters that describe the battle. Uh, again, I'm not going to spend the time talking about everything that happens during that battle. Again, you can go back and watch the other video. But here are the nations, and this is the important part for tonight. Here are the nations that are going to rise against Israel as that Gog and Magog coalition. Now, I've told you before, the Bible talks about two battles of Gog and Magog. So think about World War I, World War II. It's the same kind of thing. You've got Gog and Magog I, which is Ezekiel 38 and 39, and then you've got Gog and Magog II, which is the, uh, the very final battle between God and Satan before he's cast into the lake of fire uh, for eternity. Okay, So they're two totally different battles. Uh, because this Gog and Magog one is an earthly battle. Uh, it happens between the nations and them coming against Israel. The nations that are involved in that are these. Uh, Rosh or Russia, Magog, which involves Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Afghanistan. Meshach and Tubal, which is Turkey and Russia again. Persia, which is modern-day Iran. Ethiopia, which is modern-day Sudan or Sudan. Uh, Libya, which is modern-day Libya, Algeria, and Tunisia, so the, basically the northern part of Africa. Gomer, which is definitely Turkey. Beth Tagarma, which is the, the borderlands between Turkey and Russia. Okay? Now, here's what's interesting about those nations. Okay? One, all are Islamic with a hatred of the Jewish people with the exception of Russia. All right? But right now, and this has been going on since I even taught this, Russia is beginning to re-exert power over former Soviet bloc nations. Remember, we did this back like in, what, 2018, 2019, something like that? And I, I've got, they were in battle with Crimea at the time. I put Ukraine, where are we now? And Moldova is just this little bitty of a thing. So if the, depending on what ends up happening here with Ukraine, look for Moldova to fall somewhere in that mix in the next little bit. And it's rapidly forming, Russia is rapidly forming alliances with both Turkey 
and Iran. And if you've been paying attention to anything that's been going on with the war between Israel and Hamas, Turkey, even though it is a NATO nation, has been vehemently uh, attacking Israel uh, for what's been going on uh, with Hamas. Uh, even though they're part of NATO, uh, they are still a very Islamic country. Of course, Erdogan uh, uh, is, uh, is heavily, strongly, uh, religiously Muslim. That's why you see a lot of the things that are going on in regards to that. But here's the key. And I mentioned this ever how many years ago the original talk was. What's interesting about that list of nations is the countries that are not listed. And as I told you then, I've always been kind of curious about the why about that. Okay, Those countries that are not listed are Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt. And I left the question there, why? Why do we not see them specifically mentioned? Now, if you look at Egypt today, Egypt is a very minor, very weak power. It may very well be that Egypt, and I think I even said that then, I haven't watched that video uh, in a long time, but for Tunisia and Algeria and Libya to get to Israel, they got to go through where? Egypt. If you're looking at the map, they got to go that way. So it may be that Egypt is giving their tacit support even though they're not supplying military, okay? Can't swear to that, but that, that it would make sense given the geography, all right? Now, the other countries, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan are all countries that border, literally border the land of Israel. So why do you not see them given the fact that what's going on right now is involving those very nations. We're seeing, we're seeing rockets come out of Lebanon. We're seeing rockets come out of Syria. We're seeing rockets coming out of Gaza. That's all of those areas, and they're all bordering Israel, and yet for some reason, they're not part of the Battle of Gog and Magog. Why? It's always bugged me. <laughs> There's two questions here that bug me. This is the other one that's bugged me. As I've been studying, I came across something. And I'm not the first person to see this, but you know, you study and you study and you study, and then you find somebody that says something, and then you get to chasing the rabbits, and you find out there's a lot more there than whatever you would have, you'd have imagined. Psalm 83 may very well give us the answer. Okay? Now, Psalm 83, most of the Psalms, as you know, are written by David. But several of them are written by Asaph. We've talked about, you know, Brother Bob, when he was here last time, he preached that message from one of the Psalms of Asaph. So Asaph was a psalmist. He was a worship leader. He was a songwriter. But the Bible makes it clear that he was also a prophet. All right? Second Corinthians, or Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 30. Uh, Moreover, Hezekiah. That can't be Deuteronomy. And it'd be 29. I'll have to get that reference right. I, I, I quoted, I, I wrote down the wrong book here. I'll, I'll find it. Do, uh, but anyway, moreover, Hezekiah, the king of the princes, commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. The word seer there is another word that the Bible uses for prophets, and it's 2 Chronicles 29 30, not Deuteronomy. <laughs> I copied it down wrong off the slide. So it's 2 Chronicles, so mark that out there. Now, here's what Psalm 83 tells us, and it just happens to be a psalm of Asaph. All right? Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. What does that sound like? Is that not the exact battle cry that you hear coming out of Hamas, Lebanon, Hezbollah, all of those countries, right? Let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. That, is, that, that sounds exactly like the Ayatollahs in Iran. All right? Now, for they have consulted together without, uh, 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 with consent. They are confederate against thee. The tabernacles of... Now, listen to these countries. 
the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites, of Moab and the Hagarenes. Hagar, the Hagarenes are descendants of Hagar. Okay? Uh, Ishmael, all that. Gebel and Ammon, or, or Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher also is joined with them. They have opened the children of Lot, Selah. Now look at that list of countries, and then look at this map. Here's modern-day Israel. You've got Lebanon at the top, Syria and the Golan Heights here, Jordan here, this is Israel in the West Bank, and you have Egypt, and here you have this little thing called the Gaza Strip, which is causing all the trouble right now. Now that's the modern map. Look at the old map. Damascus, Ammon, Moab, Edom, the Philistines, and Phoenician states. Those are the same places that are mentioned in that Psalm 83. And it says all of those nations have come against Israel. And it specifically calls out the area where we're talking about with what's going on with the Gaza Strip right now. All right? So that's our first key. Now what happens is, again, here are the nations. The tents of Edom are the Palestinians and southern Jordanians. Ishmaelites, the Saudis, and it's because Ishmael is considered to be the father of the Arabs. Moabs, Palestinians, and central Jordanians. The Hagarites are the Egyptians. Hagar is the matriarch of Egypt. Gebel or Biblos is the Hezbollah and, uh, Hezbollah and northern Lebanese or Lebanon. Ammon are the Palestinians and northern Jordan. Okay, Amalek, Arabs of the Sinai area. Philistia is Ham, uh, Hamas of the Gaza Strip, which is exactly where we see this battle going on right now. Tyre is Hezbollah and southern Lebanon, where we're seeing the rockets come from. So there are, the, and then Assyria, or Asher, is the Syrians and northern Iraq. So every country that's not mentioned in the Battle of Gog and Magog is mentioned in Psalm 83 as having a military desire to destroy Israel. Wipe them off the face of the earth. Right? Now, <coughs> verses 17 and 18 of Psalm 83 says this, Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah art the most high over all the earth. So the, the, the expectation of the prophet here is to see all of those nations destroyed or disabled to the point that they can no longer be a threat to Israel. Okay? So follow me so far. Because like I said, I know I'm blowing through this pretty quick. Now, intriguingly, this disabling of Israel's closest neighbors, all of those nations that are right there around them, it could explain their absence in that list of the Battle of Gog and Magog 1. By the time Gog and Magog 1 happens, these nations have probably already been neutralized. Whatever this comes about, they're no longer, they're no longer able to mount up anything. So you don't see them in this Battle of Gog and Magog because they're just not a threat. Okay? And this specifically, again, going back to the Battle of Gog and Magog, and this is why I say it has to happen first. Psalm 83 has to happen first, is because it specifically says that one of the drivers for the Battle of the Gog and Magog is the fact that Israel feels like they're safe in the land. Okay? They're surrounded by all of these nations that are constantly taking pot shots. They have the Iron Dome. They have all of this stuff to try to prevent the very kind of thing that happened back on October the 7th. So for them to feel safe in the land, something dynamically has to happen that's different in this area. And Ezekiel 38, verses 10 and 11 says this, Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind. He's talking about the, about the nations of Gog and Magog. And thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. As long as those nations are surrounding Israel, Israel will never feel that way. Right? They're constantly on edge. 
because of this. So that's definitely not the condition of Israel today. And even if, and the more I've studied this, I can, I, I'm 99.999999 sure based on what we see here that Israel will not wipe out Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Even if they manage to knock out the sect that's there, others are just going to come right back in and fill the void. Okay? Uh, because it has to. It has to. That's the thing. This, so uh, Israel will still be on guard. Okay? A recent article in Geopolitical Futures, which is the magazine, it's the secular um, news site that I get the subscription to, uh, that keeps track of stuff going on all, all, all over the world. But I've really paid a, paid a lot of attention to it, especially during this with Israel and Hamas. This came out yesterday. Okay, talking about Lebanon, all right, which is in the north of Israel, all right, describing itself as the imminent anti-Israel resistance movement. Hezbollah has continuously said it would support the Palestinians in their struggle against Israel. When Hamas launched its October 7th attack on Israel, Hezbollah found itself compelled to show token solidarity, immediately embarking on low-grade attacks on Israeli positions in the Upper Galilee. Hezbollah failed to realize that it caught Israel at a moment of an unprecedented breach of national security. Thousands of Israeli residents near the border with Lebanon fled their houses insisting that they would not return until Hezbollah was evicted from the border area. Now remember, we're talking about Israel here. We're talking about the nations surrounding Israel and the Israeli people are saying, invade them if you have to, but get rid of them. Why? So we can feel safe. What does Ezekiel 38 say? We feel safe. Right? Now, four weeks after the start of the Israel-Hamas war and before Israel's demand that Hezbollah leave southern Lebanon, Nasrallah, who's the leader of Hezbollah, announced that now, and that's the key word, and I emphasized it. It's not emphasized in the article. Nasrallah announced that now was not the time for the great war against the Jewish state. Now is the key word. What does that tell you? If it's not now, then there's a plan for later. Right? All right. For Hezbollah to pull out from South Latani would be to renounce its anti-Israel mission, surrender, surrender its domestic political power, and accept disarmament. In other words, Hezbollah cannot retreat and its refusal to do so will inevitably lead to war regardless of the outcome. It seems that Hamas' October 7th attack will seal not only its fate, but also that of Hezbollah, whose underestimation of Israel's response gave it uh, the cause for war. Now, to be transparent, Global Political future, Futures is a secular news site. They don't, they're not seeing this through a biblical lens. But what they are saying is basically either Hamas or Hezbollah has to go or Israel does. There are no other options. Okay? And that's basically what they're saying in that article. Now, the scriptural description there given in Psalm 83 seems to paint the picture of what's going to happen. It's going to be Hamas and Hezbollah that bows, that's destroyed. But as the leader of Hezbollah said, not now. Okay? Not only do I think Hamas and Hezbollah will continue to exist, but based on Scripture, what we're also going to see at the same time, if, if 83, if Psalm 83 has got anything to do with what we're seeing now, what we're going to see is an increase in the rhetoric the volatility, uh, the uh, vitriol of the other nations, Jordan and Syria and all of that, that, that's also surrounding Israel, you're going to see a ramp up of their denouncing of Israel and saying that you know Israel's still our enemy and all these kind of things, even though they've been at relative peace for a while. Well, in April of 2023, so six months or so before Hamas and Israel, or Israel-Hamas war. 
This was April 2023 in a new site. Jordan draws closer to Iran while displaying hostility to Israel. Remember who the country is that's leading it from the east, the Battle of Gog and Magog? Persia, which is, which is, is Iran. Okay? So here's the headline. Officials from Iran and Jordan are preparing to meet. And again, this was in April. Uh, are preparing to meet to improve relations and cooperation between the two countries. The agreement to meet as soon as possible came during a phone conversation on April the 21st between Iranian Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullahian and Jordanian Foreign Minister Ayman al Safadi. The announcements follow a meeting between, and I'm not saying them again, and Jordanian King Abdullah II on the sidelines of the second Baghdad Conference for Cooperation and Partnership held in Amman, Jordan in December. So this would have been December 2022. Despite being one of the first Arab countries to establish relations with Israel nearly 30 years ago, Jordan has recently displayed a more hostile face uh, to its official rhetoric about Israel has grown increasingly negative, if not vitriolic, in both public forums and Jordan's government sponsored media. So even though Jordan has been a relatively peaceful partner with Israel for 30 years, you're now beginning, and this was before Israel Hamas. This was not a reaction to what happened. This was before Israel Hamas war. Jordan is already ramping up the talk. Look at your map. Jordan is the entire eastern side of Israel. Moab, Edom, all of those Old Testament names are modern-day Jordan. Okay? Now, uh, if you, if, and I didn't quote all the articles. Like I said, I knew I didn't have that much time. <laughs> but but to increase, uh, tensions are continuing to increase between Lebanon and Israel. They're shooting rockets into Israel even today. Syria and Israel. Same thing's going on there as well. So that's every nation that surrounds Israel. And then you've got that little bit of strip down at the bottom that, again, is specifically called out in Psalm 83 that we call the Gaza Strip. Okay? The current Israel-Hamas war has seen rockets from all of those areas except Jordan. And like I said, Jordan is beginning to ramp up its rhetoric and has been going on. This has been going on now for quite some time. Now, Given, here's kind of my summary. Psalm 83 seems to indicate some type of conflict that leaves the nations around Israel without strong defenses or military capabilities. Something happens. It's going to be a war from all appearances. But something's going to happen that's going to put those nations that border Israel at a great disadvantage. As a result of that, this will lead to Israel dropping their guard, which is exactly how they got attacked this time with Israel and Hamas. They, the, the, is, the Israeli government has openly admitted they lost sight of what was going on. They dropped their guard. And that's what allowed the 1,200 to be killed, the 200 and some uh, to be kidnapped. Uh, and so... Their dropping of that guard is what precipitates that battle of Gog and Magog. Oh, we're safe, everything's good, and that's going to be the driver for all of these nations to come in in the battle of Gog and Magog. But those other nations aren't a player because they've already been defeated. They've already been destroyed, okay? And like I said, I truly believe that the battle of Gog and Magog is the battle that triggers the rapture, one way or the other, either right before or right after. Now, that also explains why the Psalm 83 nations are not mentioned in the conflict of Ezekiel 38 and 39. If Psalm 83 happens first, they're not a power broker. They don't have the might. They don't have the military. They do not have the defense. So instead of those nations being a part of the battle of Gog and Magog, they're just how everybody gets there. Okay? Now, they, they just simply will not have the capability of participating to a significant degree. The implication as well is that there will be a period of time between Psalm 83 and the Battle of Gog and Magog 1. There has to be at least some period of time between the two, all right, for Israel to get comfortable. Why is that important? 
basically what that says is we may, depending on God's timing, we may be here to see Psalm 83. Because there will be some period of time for Israel to get comfortable before Ezekiel 38 and 39. And what we're seeing right now with Israel and Hamas is just the stirrings. The beginning of all this. That's why you're seeing stuff coming in from Lebanon. That's why you're seeing stuff coming in from Syria. That's why you're seeing the attack that came out. And it's Hezbollah and Hamas that's involved in all of this. All right? So the current Israel-Hamas conflict is basically just another piece of the puzzle that's going to continue to unite Israel's neighbors, all of them that neighbor the country, and cement their hatred for Israel and facilitate this plan of whatever happens in Psalm 83. Hezbollah, like I said in that one quote, has already indicated that there is a large war on the horizon. They said, now's not the time. So there is a plan somewhere or an idea. Uh, this gutting, especially of Jordan's offensive and defensive capabilities in Psalm 83 answers my other question. And this is a question that I have had since I started teaching the book of Revelation when I was 20 years old. Okay? And considering I'm about to turn 55, that's a long time to have a question. All right? And here's the question. In Revelation chapter number 12 and verse 14, the Bible says this, And to the woman, talking about Israel, to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished or protected or taken care of for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now, I'm not going to go back and read all of Revelation chapter number 12, but let me give you the skinny. What this is basically saying is, is that the time, times, and half a time is the last three and a half years of the tribulation. At the midpoint of the tribulation, uh, the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple says, I am God. The Bible says in another place that a third of Israel, a third of the people of Israel, will reject that and they will, uh, they will deny that the Antichrist is God because Christ said he'll set himself up as God in the temple, right? So they will deny that. They will flee into the wilderness, okay? Where is that wilderness? Every prophecy scholar that, I, that deals with a pre-trib premillennial view of prophecy says that this wilderness area is in what today is modern day Jordan or uh, southern Edom if you're looking at the Old Testament name but the southern part of Jordan it's a place called Petra alright now we've had Sabrina and I have had, have had the privilege of being there it is high rock walls and remember we've talked about that during the tribulation that modern warfare will pretty much cease to exist because of all of the EMP stuff knocking out a lot of the high-end electronics. So we're talking about going back to rifles and guns, and when you've got that kind, of an, that kind of structure around you, all of that rock structure, it makes it hard to take you over. Okay? But why do, they, why do biblical scholars think that it's Petra? Well, it comes back to the Battle of Armageddon. Okay? In Revelation chapter number 19 and verse 13, this is at the end of the tribulation. It talks about Christ coming to the battle of Armageddon. And in verse 13, it says something really interesting. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Now, if you go and read the rest of Revelation 19 from that point on, he comes to the battle having already soaked his garments in blood. Where'd that come from? Where'd that blood come from? Well, there's an interesting verse in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 63, verse number 1. Who is he, who is this, that cometh from Edom with, uh, uh, with I hate when I do that, uh, with, what? With dyed garments from Basra, thank you. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Those dyed garments, the phrase there is talking about them being dipped in blood. So who is this that's coming from Edom, Basra, 
Petra that had his garments stained. And then in Revelation 19, you see him coming into Armageddon with those garments stained. So here's what happens. Christ returns, but before he even comes to the battle of Armageddon, he goes to Petra, Basra, Edom, same place. He goes there and makes sure that the Jews who have been there for three and a half years and who have been uh, shot at and tried to be taken out during that three and a half years, but God protects them, that's what Revelation 12 says. He comes and destroys the enemy there and then comes to the battle of Armageddon. Now, this is where my question has been, and this is the Psalm 83 connection to all of this. The question that I've always had is this. How do you, if, let's say two and a half to three million Jews evacuate into Jordan? The question that I've always had is, and they get to Petra, why doesn't the Jordanian military and the Jordanian government stop them? Why do you not see a battle? Why do you not see them trying to stop them from getting to this place? What would you do if you had two million people suddenly cross the border, except in the United States? Uh, what, what would you do? You would rally the military and you'd start taking them out because they're invading your country. And yet that doesn't happen. And my question's always been, why? Why doesn't it happen? Psalm 83 is probably the answer. They don't have the capability. Israel floods the land, and they're able to get to Petra because the Jordanian military is pretty much non-existent. It's already going to be in the shape that it's going to be in like the rest of the Arab nations are going to be, or the Islamic nations are going to be in after the Battle of Gog and Magog. Remember we said, by the end of the Battle of Gog and Magog, there is going to be very little Islamic presence in the Middle East because the Battle of Gog and Magog wipes them out. I think the, I th and there's a passage and basically it's one-sixth of all of those nations is all that's left. So the first pass is Psalm 83 to take out the neighbors. Gog and Magog then takes out the rest. And that explains how Israel can get into Jordan at the midpoint and not be stopped. It explains why you don't see the neighboring nations mentioned in the battle of Gog and Magog because they've already been took care of. So your order of events is Psalm 83, Ezekiel 38, 39, and then the book of the Revelation. That's your order of events. Okay? And what that also tells us is that all of this stuff that we're seeing going on between Israel and Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and the Gaza Strip is the precursor, the trembles for the earthquake that's about to happen. We're seeing it play out in real time. And that's why I said you will not see Hamas completely out of the Gaza Strip. Why? Because Psalm 83 says they're still there as an enemy. So Israel is under tremendous pressure to stop what they're doing. They will not flush them all the way out yet. But there's coming a day when they will but then that's just going to precipitate the next piece of the puzzle, which then precipitates the rapture, which precipitates the tribulation. So now, that is as best as I study, that's what we see happen here. And that's how what's going on in Israel with Israel and Hamas right now plays into this. This is just the beginning of sorrows. The Bible says there will be rumor, wars and rumors of wars, and that's what we're seeing right now. Questions or comments? I didn't do too bad. 40, 40 minutes, not bad. Comments or questions? Uh huh?
No, no, no. The 67 war. Yeah. How is it different than the 67 war? How is it different than the others? The answer is the question is, it goes back to verse 17 and 18 of Psalm 83. Wipe them out forever. They've never been wiped out forever. They're always there. This, the Psalm 83 battle will be the thing that takes them out forever. That's why you don't see them in the battle of Gog and Magog. And then after that point, all the Arab or all the Islamic nations there are destroyed anyway. So that's the answer. No, that's a good question. Matter of fact, when I was doing the research for it, I actually looked, tried to make sure that I could answer that question in case somebody asked. Because I had the same question. How do you differentiate it between the two? Or between other conflicts? Somebody else? Yes, sir. I think what's going to end up happening in Ukraine, and this is not so much a biblical prophecy thing other than the fact, like I said, what we've seen, there are prophecies that deal with the northern lands. Uh, and when it's talking about the northern lands, it's really talking about Russia. Look at Israel and look straight north. <laughs> you got Turkey and you got Russia. Um, but there are prophecies throughout that talk about these lands to the north. Um, and what we're seeing now with what we saw in Crimea already, what we're seeing in Ukraine now, is Israel trying to reassert, or not Israel, Russia, trying to reassert its dominance over lands that were once part of the old Soviet Union. Okay, that's why uh, those other nations, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, all of those are part of that same block. Okay, what we're seeing, and what we, and, and Putin has made no, he's made no bones about this. His intent is to restore the USSR as far as the size of the country. Okay, um, the government structure may be somewhat different, but the size of the territory, he wants to restore it to the pre-Soviet or to the Soviet Union days. That's why, now, you know, his argument about uh, Ukraine has been, we need Ukraine as a buffer between us and the motherland, uh, the rest of Russia, because of NATO encroachment. That's, that was the battle cry when they first started this war. But honestly, with what happened in Crimea, uh, the um, uh, the situation with Ukraine. Now, I, th I think what's going to end up happening in Ukraine, and again, geopolitical futures writes a lot about this, but I think what's going to end up happening in Ukraine is they're going to walk away from this whole conflict with the Donbass. That's that uh, northeastern section of Ukraine. Uh, they're going to walk away with that. Because if you remember, when they started the war, what they said was, is we want to liberate our Russian people that are in Ukraine, and that was in that Donbass region, okay? I think in the end, you're going to see them get the Donbass. Ukraine is going to shrink by that much, but Ukraine will then will continue to have sovereignty over the rest of it. But I think the Donbass is going away. What you're seeing with Rosh or Russia right now is just them reasserting their dominance on the world stage. If you go back after the fall of the Soviet Union uh, and you look at the early 2000s, basically they were barely a power broker at times. And in the last 10 years, you have seen them assert themselves back onto the world stage. And this is just one of the ways they're doing it. Crimea, Ukraine. I, I really think Moldova at some point one of two things is going to happen with Moldova. Either they're going to do the same thing that they've done with Ukraine with Moldova, which is basically invade the land, and Moldova has no standing army to speak of. They got nothing. So Israel will base, or not Israel, but Russia will just basically go in, or they'll do what they've done with some of the other countries like Belarus and some of the other countries, is they'll just make sure their people are the ones who are leading the country. And so they'll be a proxy if they're not directly taken over. But it's just, the whole Rosh thing is just them coming back into the power play that they need to be for the Battle of Gog and Magog to kick in. Okay? Somebody else? Yes, sir. I, th <laughs> I think personally, uh, okay, have an effect on what? Let me make sure I understand what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, they're supplying arms and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, but where you're going to see China 
as the biggest part, the biggest player is later on in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, during the tribulation because it talks about those kings of the east coming from that side. That's where you're going to see that. China has always been relatively coy, and I guess that's the best term to use, um, when it comes to their involvement with the Middle East. Uh, they, they would much rather stay on the sidelines and supply things or whatever else rather than get directly involved. And that's exactly what they're doing now. There's no difference. Uh, they have, you know, they they have worked with uh, Iran. They have worked with Russia uh, on materiel and that kind of thing, but they're not actively involved in the battles themselves. You won't see that happen. I don't, uh, as far as them getting directly involved, uh, at least from a scriptural standpoint that we can tell, you're not going to see them get directly involved until the latter part of the tribulation, and then it's going to be basically, a, and one of these days we'll get into a big discussion about this. Not everybody, everybody at first is going to see the Antichrist as the guy who can get us out of this mess. By the end of the tribulation, that's not the case. As The kings of the east are not coming initially to fight Christ. If you look at the passages of Scripture, they're coming to Armageddon to fight each other. You're going to have those that are loyal to the Antichrist, you're going to have the kings of the east coming in, and it's going to be a battle for world dominance. But as they get there, then this bigger threat appears, and that bigger threat is Christ himself. And that's what you read about in Psalm 2 when it's talking about there, you know, who is this that takes counsel? You know, uh, let's just go over there since we're so close. Let's just go over here and read it. Psalm 2 uh, it says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And then it says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Uh, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Remember what it says happens at the battle of Armageddon? It's the sword of his mouth that destroys them. That's the same description that you see here. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Again, the battle of Armageddon. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the othermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So what happens is, is that China and the other kings of the east, whoever those kings may be, they begin to move in toward this side of the world, the western side, where the Antichrist is in power, and it's, it's an all-out battle for who's going to control the world, which is what China's aim is anyway. But at that point, they're going to see the Antichrist in a more weakened state. The playing fields are going to be even, or pretty much even, because again, we've said that because of all of the natural disasters, the high-end electronics are going to go away. So what happens, when that happens, what are you left with? You're left with regular armaments and armies. Who's got the biggest standing army in the world? China. So they start moving this way. You've got the Antichrist and what's left of that European con uh, conglomeration coming together. And the initial idea is to fight each other. But then Christ comes. And instead they turn their attention to him and try to defeat him because who wants somebody else ruling over both of you? And that's what you see in Psalm 2. That's what you see in Revelation 19. Oh, you're talking about, yeah, as far as for the invasion, potentially. But, but what's interesting about that and why I question it, materiel, I would think so, as far as the armaments and things like that. But the one thing you don't see in, the, in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is any peripheral destruction. And you would think if God's going to destroy Russia for their involvement, if there's Chinese troops involved, China's going to get a chunk of it too. And you really don't see that. It's all centralized on those, on those things. So that's why I really don't think China's involved there other than, like I said, armaments. I mean, it's just like right now. Uh, uh, the U.S. is being accused, and they may very well have done it for all I know. I've not had time to look at it. But of supplying white phosphorus to Israel to use against Lebanon. Uh, in their armaments. And so you would see China doing something like that, but not being directly boots on the ground. Okay? Because they're just not mentioned anywhere in Romans, in uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39, but they're heavily mentioned there in Revelation. 
somebody else. No? Right. Yeah, the Psalm 83. It'll be that Psalm 83 battle. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, from a political standpoint, I don't have any doubt of it at all. Now, for those of you who couldn't hear what Aaron was saying, basically he's saying, okay, you've got Psalm 83, and this is the time when, it, like right now, they're pressuring Israel to stop. And I do believe... Israel's going to stop. I think you're going to hear something between now, probably in the first of the year, that Israel is basically going to stop the, uh, uh, the bombardments. They're going to keep a military presence in Gaza for a, a period of time, all of that kind of stuff, to make sure they ferret out any sales or anything like that. I think that's going to be the thing that you're going to hear. Uh, of course, there'll be a big uproar about them occupying the land again, but Israel's not going to care uh, for a period of time. But you have this ceasefire. So what will probably end up happening with Psalm 83, based on the description that we see there, is that there will be an attack. Israel this time says, I don't care what you say. We're taking care of all of them. We're going to take care of business. And they're going to take out everybody that's had anything to do with it. And that's why you see these nations reduced to some semblance of their former self. And then that may be one of the very reasons uh, as a... Uh, payback that a lot of the nations that were calling for Israel for this ceasefire that's the, one of the very reasons that they actually come in uh, in the battle of Gog and Magog is to right the wrong uh, yeah right right exactly as, as a matter of fact what was interesting uh, what was interesting is that as I was studying for this, I ran across an article that's written by a Jewish, not Christian, but a Jewish perspective. And they actually made mention of the fact that one of the drivers, one of the potential drivers for that battle of Gog and Magog is Israel's dominance after this Psalm 83 thing. So it's exactly what you're saying. And this was coming from a Jewish source which I thought was really, really interesting. Like I said, there is so much about this I could talk about, and I'm trying to be good. Because uh, we could go for a long time on this. Somebody else? What's that? Oh, yeah. I know, like I said, yeah you don't know how bad. Uh, but anyway, somebody else? Well, God bless you. I hope that gives you a little bit of a different perspective or a little bit deeper perspective maybe on what we're seeing going on right now and how it all ties to Scripture. And uh, what we're seeing is, is pieces of the puzzle just falling into place. You just got to keep your eyes looking up and looking out. All hearts and minds clear. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the truth of your word. Thank you for the wonderful questions tonight, a lot of good perspective as we're looking at these things. And Father, help us to understand that we predict and we look at these things based on the knowledge that we have today. Something may happen six months from now that changes some interpretations of these things. But at the same time, Father, how we thank you that your word stands forever. We give you the praise and glory now for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Choir.